Hey, New Life. Welcome to Church Online today. Hey, before we get going, leave a comment in the feed here. Check in, let us know you're here. It's great to be in church with you today, even if it is online for right now. And hey, if you're new with us, we just want to say welcome. Thank you for joining us today. It's great to have you with us. Hey, if you're brave enough, leave a comment in this feed. Let us know that you're new. We would love to welcome you. If you're just checking things out today, though, that's totally cool. But we would love to get to know you better. So send us a private message after service today. If you have any questions, if you'd like to get to know us better, we would love to get connected with you. So with all that said, it's time to get started with church. So let's get started with worship. Well, good morning, New Life. It's good to see you all today. Would you please join us for some awesome worship this morning? Oh, 
When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy When brokenness and pain is all I know No, I won't be shaken I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love
I miss being with you today, but I'm glad we get to share this time together online. As we approach this whole situation and crisis together, let's remember the instruction of the Apostle Paul to the Colossians. And us, as I read through this, we're going to also pray this scripture together. Colossians 3, 12 and 13, the, the Apostle says, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Lord, give us kind and compassionate hearts and let us show patience with one another when the lines are long and the shelves are bare, holding our tongue, giving the benefit of the doubt, overlooking flaws and faults and forgiving one another because you have surely forgiven us for so much. Colossians 3.14, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called to one body, and be thankful. Father, let us put on love. Let it be our finest garment. Let us parade love. And let your peace fill all hearts, no matter what storms we face. You, Jesus, are more powerful than the storms and the challenges and the viruses. Let us not forget all the blessings that you have poured out on us. You created us and redeemed us. Let our thankfulness well up in praise and adoration and love for you and love for others. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. Lord, your word is love. Love each other as I have loved you, is what you said, Jesus. Let us abide in your love, and out of that love, let us share your words with others, spurring one another on and thanking you along the way. And finally, Colossians 3.17, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father, through him. Father, in these challenging times, let us fix our eyes on Jesus and walk in a way that honors you. In Jesus' name, we thank you and we ask you. Amen. Well, I just want to say thank you for your continued giving to New Life. It's all a very unusual situation that we find ourselves in. Since we're not meeting in person today, you can still give at wearenewlife.church or you can text your giving to the number 84321. You can also mail it to New Life at 6115 Shattuck Road, Saginaw. Zip code is 48603. Your giving will enable us to continue our ministry to our church family and community as we face these challenges. When we give, we're always responding to God's grace. And as I do each week, let me read the scripture to you, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, and 8. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that all, having all efficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Father, let our hearts give gener cheerfully, generously to our neighbors and those in need. We know, Lord, you will provide above and beyond. So our needs are met, and so are the needs of our neighbors and friends and family. We just thank you. Thank you for the gift. Thank you for the giver. Multiply it back, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
short update on where we're at as far as the coronavirus and social distancing. We're still collecting hope totes uh, for the rescue mission. So fill up a bag, uh, personal care products, drop them off at the church. If you cannot uh, get it right now, you can hold them. We'll make sure the mission gets them or it's, it's possible that we might be able to come by and pick them up from you as well. So just let us know. Uh, as a reminder, all in-person meetings have been uh, canceled at New Life for now. Uh, so uh, we look forward to meeting together again in the future. So pray for one another. Um, please let us know if you have any prayer requests or support requests by calling us at 989-498-0223. And you can also message us on Facebook. Starting Monday, I will lead a short devotional on New Life's uh, Saginaw Facebook page at 7.30 a.m. The address is www.facebook.com slash NLCF Saginaw. So please tune in at 7.30. The devotion is going to go Monday through Friday. Uh, about 10 minutes apiece, we're going to start on Psalm 1 on Monday. So stay connected and grow, so join me on Monday at 7.30. So uh, please take your Bibles out at home, and I want you to open to Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. Four, verses 35 through 41, which is a great story. It's being quoted a lot right now because it's just such a great story. Uh, and it talks about storms, and we're clearly in a storm. I looked up the definition of a storm, and there were lots of different definitions. Uh, but I'm just going to read you a few of the ones that I selected. A disturbance of the atmosphere marked by wind and usually by rain, snow, hail, sleet, or thunder and lightning. We've all been through those. A disturbed or agitated state. I would say that's where we're at right now. A tumultuous outburst or a violent assault on a defended position where you storm the gates. In case you haven't noticed, we are really experiencing a storm. This is a time of disturbance and agitation. It feels like there was just an outburst of action in just a few hours and a few days last week especially. Everything was just changing all around us. Some even may feel like the procedures and actions or some assault on our freedom. I read Facebook posts, so I see that. And you might disagree with what the government is doing or local authorities or even what we're doing at New Life. Whatever you might be experiencing, let me give you some good news. Jesus is riding out the storm with you. Jesus is in the boat. And Jesus brings peace in the middle of the storms. So the Gospel of Mark. Mark is awesome. He just moves from one action story to the other. He just wants us to see that Jesus is on the move. Jesus runs off demons, heals people, preaches, teaches, forms a team of 12. We call them the apostles. Jesus was moving. Chapter 4, Mark, I'm going to read this little passage to you, and then we're going to break it down verse by verse. Mark 4, 35. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him They took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with them. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he, Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? It's just a great story. So much packed into just such a few words. So let's break it down verse by verse. Mark 4.35, On that day when evening had come. So night setting in. He, Jesus, said to them, let us go across to the other side. And he's referring to the Sea of Galilee. It's where Jesus walked on water. Some of the apostles, like Peter, were fishermen there. Now, the Sea of Galilee is not a sea. It's actually a lake. It's a little bit larger than Houghton and Higgins if you combined them. But nothing like the Great Lakes. Jesus says, let's go to the other side. And in this case, the other side really was the other side. There was a side that was primarily Jewish and another side that was Gentile. He's going to go to the other side with a whole set of different practices and beliefs. And as soon as they made it to the other side, at, right after this story ends, they're met with a by a demon-possessed man that Jesus frees from demonic possession and sends him back home where he can live a normal life again. Mark 4.36. And leaving the crowd... 
They took him, Jesus, with them in the boat, just as he was. This was a spontaneous trip. And other boats were with them. It wasn't alone. It was a convoy. So they took Jesus with them in the boat. Perhaps the boats belonged to one of the apostles that were fishermen, or Peter and Andrew or James and John. They fished on this lake. That was their business. Uh, Jesus was a carpenter by trade, and as far as we know, he didn't have a boat. He wasn't a sailor. Mark 4, 37, and a great windstorm arose when they're out at night on the, on the lake. And the waves were breaking in the boat so that the boat was already filling. This wasn't unusual. The Sea of Galilee is, is well below sea level and it's surrounded by hills. And when the wind comes sweeping down, it's almost like a bowl and it stirs up the lake, uh, producing waves to eight to 10 feet. So picture this, the boat was rocking, the water was pouring into the boat, which was filling up. It was a storm, buckets going, bailing out the boat. And on top of it all, it's nighttime. It was dark. It was not a good situation. In some ways, that's may how we've all felt, you felt, in the last week. It's nonstop change. It's this adjustment and that closing. And, uh, and it's like, what are we going to do? I mean, it's been like a storm. It's been an assault on everything that we know that's normal. Lots of change. Now, imagine this scene in the Bible was in a movie. And the camera was panning showing all the action in this boat at night. Men in motion, buckets dipping, boat rocking, wind howling. And then the camera stops and settles on Jesus. Mark 4.38 says, But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. Through this massive storm, the boat's rocking, people are probably yelling and screaming and bailing and whatever else might go on 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 a boat like this. Jesus was asleep. He must be a really sound sleeper. Or perhaps all this action that Marx talks about, he's just plain exhausted. Several decades ago, uh, they found a preserved fishing boat at the Sea of Galilee, I think in the 1980s. And it was dated right before Jesus to right after Jesus. So it was probably a boat like they used at that time. About 26 and a half feet long, seven and a half foot wide, and about four and a half foot deep. Held 15 people, four rowers, and a helmsman who controlled the rudder and gave commands in the back of the boat, the stern, where the cushion was. That was the driver's seat of the boat. Jesus was actually asleep in the driver's seat. So Jesus was asleep, asleep at the wheel in the midst of this storm. There was another time a prophet was sleeping in a ship during a storm. His name was Jonah. He was swallowed by a fish in the Mediterranean Sea. Jonah was running away from God, but this is not the same. Here's Jesus sleeping on the cushion. He had been moving, building a team, preaching, teaching, healing, driving out demons with just a word. And he was tired, but there was so much more going on that than here. The word says in Psalms 4, 8, in peace, I will lay down and sleep for you alone. Make me dwell in safety. Not the situation around us. Only God allows us to dwell and save. Jesus was asleep because his trust was in God the Father. His Father, he was not worried. He was at peace. He was safely in the hands of God. Everyone was worried, but Jesus was at peace. During the chaos and the yelling and the wind and the shaking and the rolling, Jesus was peacefully sleeping. I want that kind of peace in my own life. Isaiah the prophet predicted the coming of Jesus. He writes in Isaiah 9, 6, you've seen it on Christmas cards. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. See, there is a direct and unbreakable connection between Jesus and peace. I want the peace of Christ in my own life. Jesus is sleeping in the boat in the stormy chaos. Mark 4.38 says, And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not care? They question Jesus' love for them. When we're in storm, sometimes we question God's love for us. Do you not care? Do something, row or bail or steer or something. Do something, wake up, do something. This was a small act of faith when they went to ask him. They didn't know what Jesus could do, but they believed he could do something. He healed people. 
He ran off demons. Mark 4, 39. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. He rebuked the wind. He commanded it and said, Cease and desist. He told the sea, Peace, be still. I like to say he told the wind and the waves to sit down and shut up. When Jesus spoke, the wind and the waves listened. The wind ceased, the water calmed. Now, usually when the wind stops, the waves keep going. They don't just stop immediately, but not, that's not what it says. It says when Jesus commanded and the wind stopped and everything was calm immediately. One of the great church fathers, Athanasius, wrote, In the year 347, about this passage, he said, they awakened the word who was sailing with them and immediately the sea became smooth at the command of the Lord and they were saved. The word, they awakened the word. Jesus is called the word of God in scripture. He is the greatest statement of God of truth to anyone. Through Jesus, the world was created. Jesus is the king of the world. Jesus speaks in all creation, natural and supernatural, must listen and obey. Jesus can speak to any storm, the storms that brew in our souls that produce fear and anxiety. Now, fear is more than just being afraid of something. People get angry, and really they're afraid. They're angry because they're out of control, or they don't feel like they're in control. But the secret is none of us are really in control. God is in control. Sometimes we might be afraid, we get angry because our freedom is being infringed upon, overwhelmed by decisions like closing a business when you're the owner or maybe getting laid off when you're an employee. And some of you are facing that right now. Jesus can speak to that storm and bring peace. When we are at peace, then we can be at peace with others and we can offer peace to others in the midst of their storms. Peace has a spillover effect. And I believe God wants us to be ministers of peace in the midst of chaos. We can be gentle and kind and patient and encouraging to those that are in the midst of a struggle. Of course, Jesus came to earth to make peace with God for us. He did that on the cross. Isaiah predicted that too in Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. Isaiah paints this picture of what Jesus was going to do on the cross. The prophet says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we have streamed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. Jesus went to the cross for us. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. Jesus makes peace with God. And by his wounds we're healed. Jesus is the way to peace. Jesus is our peace. Jesus makes peace with God, our creator, our father. And heaven's doors are now open wide. So we have the provision of heaven and we have the peace of heaven. They're available to us. We do not need to fear. In a few weeks' time, we're going to be celebrating Holy Week. Palm Sunday, where people cried Hosanna. Good Friday, where some of the same people might have cried crucify him. And on Easter, when people proclaimed he is risen and he is alive. Jesus is alive and well, and he is still saying, peace be still to the storms in us and around us. Can you hear him speak to you? Peace, be still. Jesus has a way of speaking to the very depth of our being. Picture Jesus in that boat, all eyes on him, the wind has stopped, the waves are calm, and then he looks at them. He looks at the men in that boat, his friends, his followers. Mark 4, 14, he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Why are you running around and panicking? Why are you shouting because things aren't happening the way you thought it should? Why are you criticizing and complaining? My observation on storms is storms bring the best out of us, and they also bring the worst out of us. What is the storm of this situation bringing out of you right now? What are you learning about yourself? Storms provide us little samples of our souls, our churches, our country, our culture. It shows us what we're made of. It shows us who we have placed our faith in. The world goes crazy and then we go crazy. It just shows that we have placed our faith and trust in the world and not Jesus. The apostles were in the same storm as Jesus, but Jesus wasn't panicking. He was asleep on a cushion in the back of the boat. He was at peace. 
We serve the Prince of Peace. Peace, God says to our heart. Peace, be still, soul, relax. Why? Because Jesus is in the boat. Jesus is in the boat, and when Jesus is in the boat, you can relax. Mark 4, 40, again, he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? The men in the boat could not answer Jesus. They had seen Jesus heal people, a man that was paralyzed, a woman with a fever, a leper. Jesus had sent demons packing and set people free. But this was so much more than anything they had seen so far. Mark 4, 41 says they were filled with great fear, great reverence, awe, and said to one another, who, who then is this? And even the wind and the sea obey him. We have never seen anything like, who is this in the boat? Jesus was in the boat, but only God could do this because God was in the boat. Only God could do what Jesus did. They were getting the truth of Jesus. Jesus was more than a prophet like Jonah. Jesus was God in the flesh. The men would have known this passage. They would have learned this growing up. Psalm 107, 28 through 30. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet and he brought them to their desired haven. That's a big promise. That's what God does, but that's what God, when the wind is howling, the waves are going crazy, he speaks to them and he gets us to where we're going. And that's what God is doing right now in the midst of everything that we're going through. Jesus was in the boat and Jesus was more than a prophet. He was God in the flesh. God is that concerned about us. So we need to turn our thoughts to him, focus on him. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4 says, You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed or locked on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. He's solid. These men had the rock in the boat with them. They were, that was their anchor. Our hearts aren't captured by the storm. They're captive to Jesus. How do we do that? The Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And that seems so odd in the midst of a storm. But we rejoice in who God is and what he has done and is doing. We count our blessings. We are focused on the Lord. That verse 5 there says, Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. He's in the boat. He's with us. The scripture says he abides in us. And when we understand that, it changes our whole demeanor and we become peaceful. So we can rejoice. Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious or worried about trouble, panicking about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. See, we go to God with the worries. And to the apostles' credit, they did go to Jesus. Help us. They didn't know what he could do. They didn't know him in the depth that they would later and that we do today, but they went to him. That was a measure of faith. And he went above and beyond anything they expected. God still goes above and beyond anything we expect. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, we go to him and we present those requests to him. We go to God and say, I'm bringing it to you. You can do something and we leave it there. Thanking him, trusting him, in his cap and just leaving it in his capable hands. Philippians 4, 7 and then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It transcends all understanding. It's hard to describe to someone, but when you've we got Jesus in the boat with you and you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus, somehow there is a peace that comes that changes everything. And you hard to describe, but it's real. Have you taken him in the boat with you, the boat of your life? Have you invited him on board? That's what they did. They took him into their boat. When the storms come, he will speak peace to you. How do you invite him in? Well, the Apostle Paul kind of gives us a little summary of what Jesus did for us in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 5. He says, for what I received, I passed on to you as a first importance. That's key. This is first importance, and it's the first importance the most important thing in all of our lives, this what I'm about ready to read you right now, it's the most important thing, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He died on a cross. We celebrate on Good Friday. That he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. We celebrate on Easter. 
and that he appeared to Peter and then the 12 and to many more as evidence that he was alive and well. He died for us in our place to make between, peace between God and his people. He was buried in a tomb. He came alive on the third day, proving everything that he said. Everything that he did was ratified. It was God's stamp of approval, that resurrection. And we've based everything on that. That's our hope. That's where we get our peace from. There's something bigger and more to this world of these storms, something greater. God is greater. How do you connect with Jesus? Well, it's easy. It's just ABC. You admit you need a Savior. That's what that passage says. He died for us because we needed him. We believe in what he did. He, was, he died and was buried and was resurrected. He ascended into heaven. He's coming back again. We believe he did that for us. And we confess him. He's the Lord. He, when the apostles met him in that boat, they might have thought he was a prophet beforehand, but afterward it had to rock their world. They knew he was greater than that. When we say Jesus is Lord, we mean he's our master. We follow him. So we admit we have a need. We believe in he met the need. And we confess him as Lord. And we just begin to prioritize him in our life. He's a first priority. He's our Lord. And that is your first step to peace in your soul in the midst of storms. Father, we just thank you. We can just come to you and admit, believe, and confess. And it's the beginning of a, a journey, a trip in a boat, and you're in it. Lord, you're in the steering part. You're at the wheel. You're controlling the rudder. Even though it doesn't look like you're working, you're working, doing your thing. Lord, we admit we need you. We believe in what you did, and we confess you that you're the Lord, and we're going to let you steer the boat, even if we're not quite sure how that's going to turn out, because we know that you'll get us to the other side, because you promise. We thank you for that. I pray for anyone, Lord, right now that wants to pray that. They admit, they believe, they confess, Lord. Bless them and begin to change their lives right now as they've said that prayer. We just thank you that you still call people to yourself. You love us so much. We just thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to ask God to bless you as we end today. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Please join me on Facebook live on Monday morning at 7.30 a.m. for new online devotions, and I look forward to seeing you soon. It'll be a great day when we can gather again. Amen. Blessings. Mm -hmm.